Welcome back to My Kitchen with Jake. I'm your host, Chef Jake Osborne, and I'm hanging out with my buddy, Laura. Um, in a previous episode, we hung out with our other friend, Marty, who is a puppet, um, to emulate cooking with a child. Yes. Um, it's something that we both have a lot of experience with together. Um, and if we go way back, Laura was actually my mentor when I was in high school. Um, you were teaching Surf Safe back then. Um, so that means we've known each other for a hot minute. Like, a long minute. Yes. Um, so one of the things that we're talking about today is webfoot pines and their eggs. Um, so we've got some eggs here. Um, these are raised by a family um, in Adrian. Um, his name is Lucas, and they have about a half a dozen children um, that are involved in the operation. Uh, these are naturally raised eggs, um, so they are pasture raised. They're supplemented with grains, um, but for the most part, they're able to feed on non-grains um, and supplement with the grains, um, from my understanding of the process. Um, there's no hormones or antibiotics involved in the growth process. Um, there's no preservatives or anything like that. Um, and they're a good egg. They're, they're, they're nice. They're local. Um, they're really beautiful eggs. There's lots of colors to them, lots of variation. There's a really pretty green one in there. Um, Laura and I, we were walking through agriculture trying to choose what we were going to use um, as, a, as our promotional item for this episode. And we decided on eggs because of our most recent experience. Yeah, we um, did a whole thing with Girl Scouts and we really found and brought a, home again um, the difference between cooking at home and cooking in the industry. Yeah. Um, I, we, my husband and I taught my son to shop and cook, but a lot of kids don't even know where their eggs come from. So getting involved with this kind of a situation where you know where your eggs come from and what's in them, what's on them, how to take care of them is a big deal. Yeah. But we did find that our girls were making cake batter. <laughs> and so getting the eggs into the cake without actually getting the shell in there, having that conversation about cracking the eggs in a bowl and then adding them to it. So yeah. you're, that was a whole thing we really hadn't thought about because we have been in the industry for so long yeah. that when you're dealing with kids, you have to start at the very beginning. Yeah, we totally look past it. One thing, like when she's explaining this, you see people do it on cooking shows and other places all the time, but you take your egg, right, and you crack it into a separate bowl um, so that you can kind of observe what's going on with it. You can see if there's any odor to it. You can see if there's any unique blood spots. You can see if the albumin looks funny or whatever before you add it to the bowl. Um, I think what really happened with, oh, she was one of my favorite students. She cracked the egg right into the side of the bowl and the whole egg ended up in the mixer while the mixer was on and all of the shells got whipped into her cake batter. It was kind of devastating for her, but it was definitely a learning. But it's definitely a learning experience, right? Yeah, she learned the hard way. And most of us have learned the hard way where you put an egg in that had some issues and now your entire product has to go away. Yeah, because yeah. it's contaminated. I mean, yeah. hers was laced with physical contaminants and Lord knows what else is on it, right? And that's another conversation that we had with them about cake batter because they wanted to do what they did at home, which yeah. was lick the bowl, which quite honestly is no longer a safe option. It isn't just that the eggs might not be safe, but now the flour frequently is not safe. We've had yeah. lots and lots of recalls on flour because of pathogens that are in there. So if you're dealing with that raw batter, it's not safe to ingest it until after it's been cooked. Well, I think a lot of that came from COVID. You know, we know time and temperature abuse happens so frequent in the industry during good times. During COVID, all of those things, they spent time on ships and in cargo situations. So they've been contaminated with pests and with, they just had time for stuff to grow in it. Right? Well, the recalls have been E. coli have been and salmonella. Yeah. So two very different things that you wouldn't um, associate with flour. But it's been, over the last 10 years, we've had more and more recalls on things like that. So yeah. that's one of those things when you're dealing with kids, you want to teach them to be self-sufficient but now we really need to have a conversation about being safe, right? Yeah. Well, and if you're somebody like me, I love batter. I love it. Like, I kind of like cake batter more than I like the actual cake, if I'm being honest. Something you can do is you can pasteurize your flour. 
So Laura and I, I think, both do this pretty frequently. You lay your flour out on a cake pan and you can bake it in the oven at a low temperature. Um, and as long as it reaches around 165 um, for a minute or so, you're gonna be at least safer than you were. Right. Um, and you can always use applesauce or a banana as a substitute for an egg. Um, so if you're concerned about the egg being non-pasteurized and being raw, you can substitute it for something that you can eat raw, like applesauce or banana. Um, and it will have a similar taste, a similar texture, and because they're an egg substitute, it would probably bake the same too, um, but then you can actually eat the batter raw. Well, and a lot of us like to buy our eggs from our local person down the road, where mm -hmm. you're getting something that should not be washed before it comes to you, because once you wash those eggs, they need to be refrigerated, yep. because that changes the cell structure of the actual shell. Yep. So, if you're getting it from your local neighbor, you want to make sure those eggs do get washed before your kids touch it. Or making sure they wash their hands after they touch it because, yeah. you know, eggs and chickens mm. are, yeah. can be kind of nasty when we talk about getting the feces off of it. So making sure that doesn't get spread throughout your kitchen. Definitely. <coughs> well, and it's something that, it's a lot of people don't know that. These eggs that we have from Wedfoot Pines, they have been washed. So have all of the eggs that are in the agricole refrigerator. Right. Um, but that's because the, <clears throat> there's multiple reasons. There's a risk to non-washed eggs. Right. Um, but if you're somebody who has chickens at home, you understand this. When it comes out of the chicken's cloaca, that's what its <laughs> situation's called, um, it actually gets coated in its own preservative. And when you wash the egg, that preservative comes off. Right. Um, and eggs are porous, so all of those holes um, with the original coating on it preserves the egg. I think it's up to like 41 days at room temperature just on your countertop. But once you wash that off, that egg is no longer protected by that covering, and then it has to go into the refrigerator. Um, and that's, right. I mean, that's essential. If you wash it off and you leave it on the counter, that egg's going to rot. Um, it's kind of the similar with like preserving them in lye or something like that, or lime, I mean. Um, it seals up its right. pores, and that's what's actually preserving the egg, pre preventing oxygen from getting inside of it and preventing the the decay. Really. Well, also, if you hard-boiled eggs, yeah. how long are they good in the refrigerator? And you want to keep the ruling the same as you would with anything else, seven days or less. Yep. Because, again, you put it in boiling water, then you chilled it in ice water bath, so you have changed that cell structure. So you want to be really careful with that sort of thing also. Definitely. A lot of people take boiled eggs to lunch, too. Yes. I mean, if you're taking a cold egg with you, where has it been? Where have your hands been before they touched it and peeled it? Right. Has it still got the shell on? Does it not? There's a lot of different things that go into it. And when we were dealing with the Girl Scouts, we did kind of start at the very beginning with them when they walked into the kitchen because we were in a commercial kitchen. Yeah. So it was, did you tie your hair up? Right? Did you take off all the your bling, uh, bling that you yeah. might have with rings and that kind of thing? But, you know, a lot of them, it was like, well, I don't normally cover my hair, but we've all had that circumstance where we've gotten hair in our cake or muffin or cookie yeah. or something. So, so avoiding unpleasant. that and having that kind of conversation with them. And then, which order do you do it in? Okay, you tied your hair up, now you put on your clean apron and you wash your hands, mm -hmm. or which order? Yeah. Because they wanted to wash their hands and then tie their hair up, and that's not the way it really works, because no, then so you much. need to wash your hands again. So there was a lot of different things that working with um, kids who have never worked in a restaurant facility, those are things they don't know. We were they thrilled don't. that they loved to come and bake, and a lot of kids want to be able to do that, and it's a great thing to do with kids, but teaching them how to do it safely, where to start with clean boards. Another big conversation we had with them was their phone, because mm. most of them were using their phone as a timer or their phone as a recipe. And then, okay, what's on your phone? When we all do that so much, um, I think that there's a lot of different steps you can take before you enter the kitchen to make sure that you're safe when you go in, just like we did with the girls. Um, and we can go over some more of those when we return, when My Kitchen with Jake continues.
Okay, why don't I take this and why don't you okay. put the chicken in the fridge? I'll do that. And chicken and, always goes, raw chicken always goes in the very bottom of your refrigerator. And why is that, okay. Laura? Oh, well, there's a little issue with cross-contamination. And gravity loves you it, You really it? want to think about bloody chicken and if it drips mm -hmm. on your other food, then that's going to be a real issue. My Michigan TV is streaming everywhere on Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and more smart TV apps. My Michigan TV is on your phone too. Take us with you wherever you go. Just search for My Michigan TV on your favorite app store or visit mymitv.com. All Michigan, streaming everywhere. My Michigan TV. Welcome back to My Kitchen with Jake. I'm your host, Chef Jake Osborne, and we're hanging out here at Agricole Farm Stop, me and my buddy Laura from the Michigan Hospitality Foundation, one of our sponsors. Um, she was also a big part of putting together the MichiganFoodSafety.com website, um, which is another one of our sponsors. Um, we're hanging out at Agricole. We're talking about food safety with youth in the kitchen, the young'uns. Um, so we just chatted about webfoot, webfoot pines and what they do with their eggs. Um, but one of the things we really got talking about was our experience cooking with the Girl Scouts of Southeast Michigan um, over in Detroit, where we took, uh, it was a half a dozen, or it was a full dozen um, young ladies, 12 to 7th grade, 7th to 12th grade, um, we took them to Shed 5 and we did a cake baking extravaganza with them as part of a cake design class. Um, and we really, we learned a lot really quick, didn't we? And we really did. Yeah. Part of it is because Jake and I have worked together for a few years, so he was really um, dealing with the girls and their recipes and all that, and I was really focusing on all of that other sanitation area because yeah. the kids had been cooking at home and they hadn't actually been in a commercial kitchen before. Um, the differences in what that looks like really is a big deal. Yeah. Right? Well, and typically we're working with pro start kids and with kids that right. have a little bit of background right. in the kitchen, like a commercial space. Right. With this, I mean, they were completely noobs to the situation. Well, and also the basic wash, rinse, sanitize, air dry was something they had never even heard yeah. before. And that's, you know, even at home, it has to be something you really think about. Is it clean and is it sanitary? Yeah. Whether it's your sponge, whether it's your phone, whether it's your apples and peaches. Right. Really makes a big difference because a lot of times, and especially like we're getting into fun times where we're doing farmers markets and things like that, which we so love in Michigan to be able to use Michigan produce. I'm so but glad it's spring. When you, bring, when, you bring, <laughs> when you bring it home, where did you put the bags? Yeah. Did you wash that, that food when you used it? Did you wash that counter? I think it's a really big thing when we're talking to kids about that. And just teaching children not to touch the part you put in your mouth. Yeah. With cups and silverware, and is it a clean knife? And it, did you put that used knife into the jar, or did you reach into the pickle jar with your little digits? Yeah. And then you contaminated it because it wasn't clean. And that's, for my family, that was always one of the big things. You open a bag of chips, now are you all sticking your fingers in there? Or, and, that's right? a good way to spread some germs. It really is, especially if you're dealing with a household that might have very young children or elderly people who are a little more high risk. Yeah. Um, put it in a bowl. Don't stick your grubby hands in there. The fact that you're ingesting something with your own dirty hands, that's one thing. That's fine, yeah. Right? You can ingest your own germs all you want to, but nobody else needs to do that. No. Right? Well, and if you don't know that somebody's hands have been in the bag like that, you don't know to begin with, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. we also see that with things like allergens because more and more people have that kind of issue. I mean, obviously the big one is peanuts, right? So what did you touch? And then if you've got somebody who's coming to visit you who can't have peanut butter, yeah, are you going to keep that kitchen safe? Because PB&J obviously is it's a easy, staple. Yeah, everybody eats it. Easy to deal with, but if you stuck that knife into the peanut butter and then stuck that knife into the jelly 
<laughs> and you know, everybody who has kids, they're always sending food to school, they're always going well, to different yeah. events. And they can't send peanut butter in you there, can't. but the jelly could be a problem. And my personal favorite is kids who clean the knife by licking it. Yes, we had a couple of those. We had to grab that spatula real quick. It, everybody wants to taste the batter. Everybody wants to taste what they're doing. So they <laughs> lick it. And we right. were like, whoa, not in a commercial kitchen, you heathens. <laughs> Well, and it really does make a big difference, right? You yeah. use that spatula, and now you put it on a counter, was it clean? <laughs> and then what we were making with the Girl Scouts were cakes that, they, that their friends and family were going to be eating. So we really mm -hmm. had to up their game as we far did. as um, sanitation and clean cleanliness and don't touch your hair and phones obviously are a big conversation. Well, right? it seems obvious and it seems so sensical. And for us, it, it has become second nature. But, right. you know, some of them wanted to have their headphones in, they had their recipes on their phones. So it was really an easy way for, you know, to readjust your earmuffs or to, you know, look at your phone to wake it up. You know, it, it's such an easy way to cross contaminate from one thing to another. Right. You know, and getting everything into the containers and under refrigeration. Oh, that was that was interesting project. too. Yeah, yeah. They just didn't know that you, for ready-to-eat food, you had to be gloved up. Even though we had talked about it in the classroom, they didn't have the the hands-on experience to understand it yet. Well, also just putting on gloves, which you would think wouldn't be that yeah. big of a deal, but if you've never done it, and we've done it so many times that we don't even think about it, you know. Did you contaminate the gloves before you, did you wash your hands before you touch the gloves, right? Yeah, and we were really fortunate to ha not have many allergies, but we did have one young lady who had a tree nut allergy. It was astonishing to me to see how many of the store-bought, like, we, our class was like, I don't remember how many weeks it was, it was like 16 weeks or whatever, and we met multiple times. And we used products like store-bought fondant and store-bought buttercream and, things that had come from companies like Wilton, right? Right. And to fi find those that didn't even have nuts in them, but had been made in facilities with tree nuts, for the girls to go and understand what a facility like that was, and right. how those contaminants could just be everywhere, it really it made you understand just how quickly allergens and cross-contamination can spread to the masses. And we've seen that with things like almond flour, yeah. with people with nut allergies. I mean, I've run into people, because I teach syrup safe, I've run into people who actually, oh, well, I can't have maple syrup because I have a nut allergy, which is kind of an extreme, sort is of a, a thing? crazy thing. But yeah, so. How is maple syrup and nuts related? Because of the facility? Because of the tree. Because of the tree. Yeah, I know. I didn't, I, I had know. no idea. It's a, it's, it, I run into some, extremely unusual sorts of, of situations with people that find they're allergic to things. So, as I wonder if they can have root beer and birch beer and stuff like that, or if they'd be oh. allergic to that too. Now that's... That's a thought. That's a whole different conversation, I think. We'll that would be do sad. Little, we'll have to do a little bit. But just egg allergies yeah. is not an uncommon situation either. So. Well, and we have how many common allergies now? They just boosted it from... Eight Seven to, to nine. Eight, eight no, to nine. Eight to nine. Yep. So there's so. sesame, shellfish. Sesame is one of the new ones. Sesame's shellfish. Sesame is the new one. Yep. yep. Tree nuts. Okay, now you're confusing me. So milk, eggs. Milk, eggs. Tree nuts. Tree nuts. Peanuts. Wheat. Peanuts. Those are separate. That yep. should be one. Nope. But I Peanuts understand. Peanuts grow in the ground. Peanuts, trees tree grow nuts. in the trees. Now you've got fish, which is different shellfish. than shellfish. Yep. Fish. And then wheat and soy. Wheat and soy. And they yeah. just added the sesame. So, Which is a good one. I have a friend that's terribly allergic to sesame. When she has sesame, that reaction is so fast. Lots of countries already have that as an allergen. Um, so when I mean, you do see it, but is it sesame oil? Is it sesame seeds? Mm -hmm. And you you see sesame in a lot of different things. So yeah, same with those, soy. Yeah, those, well, soy is in so, a binder in Everything. so many prepared yeah. foods. So soy lecithin and chocolate, mm -hmm. soy and canola oils. Yep. I mean, it's everywhere. It's dangerous. Well, and it's hard um, as a parent to keep your kids safe, yeah. for sure. Uh, reading those labels, but teaching kids to read those labels and really look at it 
and you know take them to the grocery store with you and have that conversation yeah and then you can also do math well and make them part of it that was something when i was young that my mom and my grandma and my dad really took serious i didn't want to read i didn't want to write and all i wanted to do was cook and that was a good way to get me doing it and right. who'd have thought it would become a career but I, I we'd gather a cookbook every time we went on vacation and i'd obsess over it for months with my mom and we'd do the mathematic yep. equations to I'd scale it up, right? I mean, we had a decent sized family. We'd scale it up for holidays, and I could learn how to substitute some of the things and just go through the reading process. Make sure that you can follow that standard operating procedure to produce that finished product. Something for me was that was very foundational. That's actually, right. you know, my company, Kitchen Little, that's how that all started. When I was like five years old, I demanded that I got a Kitchen Little for my birthday. And ah. it was one of those little Tykes kitchens. Yep. But I called it a Kitchen Little. And it was, my parents were like, if it gets you to read and write, you got it, buddy. Now, we did that with my son, too. And I think that, and he shopped with his dad all the time and had that whole conversation. And now, he's your age. Yeah. He travels all over the world and he can cook. So he's an independent, he's a, imagine. He's also <laughs> very, um, sought after for a housemate because he actually yeah. knows how to cook. So that's really teaching your kids to be able to take care of themselves, I think is really important. But is. the shopping aspect of it, the safety of the shopping aspect, mm -hmm. but adding that math in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of my cookbooks have what it would it cost per serving. Yeah, right? you made him do the math. Well, on we it. did. It's and smart. So, you know, Math is fundamental, and mm -hmm. most of us don't like doing it, so how do you make it fun? Yeah, yep. and so is reading. Yep. Reading is fundamental. So they say, I know. <laughs> but reading cookbooks is a good way to start that. It is. Yep. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and take a break for a minute, um, and when we come back, we can talk about more opportunities and how to get your youngins involved in the kitchen and how to make cooking more of a family, family outing, right? Uh, We'll see you shortly when My Kitchen with Jake continues. I like to use cool water, but I also like to sanitize everything as I go about it. I like to use a little spray. My spray usually has a little vinegar in it. I'm going to use these. I'm, when I put them in the refrigerator, I want them ready to go, um, especially if you've got small children at home. They're likely to not ever sanitize anything, so just have it ready to eat, as they say. Pure is what you make of it. It's how the hustle of the cities can change the course of history. It's the beauty of the things we create on a canvas, on a plate, or stretched high above the sidewalk. It's a patch of green or a stretch of blue, right in the heart of downtown. It's the buzz of it all or if you prefer, it's tuning it all out. Clear your schedule and pursue your pure in Pure Michigan. My Michigan TV is streaming everywhere on Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and more smart TV apps. My Michigan TV is on your phone too. Take us with you wherever you go. Just search for My Michigan TV on your favorite app store or visit mymitv.com. All Michigan, streaming everywhere. My Michigan TV. Hi, welcome back to My Kitchen with Jake. I'm your host, Chef Jake Osborne, and this is my buddy, Laura Nesbitt, from the Michigan Hospitality Foundation, one of our fantastic sponsors. Uh, we're also sponsored by michiganfoodsafety.com, um, which you've done a lot of work with that as well. Um, it looks really good. You can find a lot of really great recipes with the nutritional yes. analysis there as well. Uh, the Michigan Healthy Foods? That's Michigan Healthy Foods. Michigan, Michigan Food Healthy. Safety is just food safety. Um, and videos, and lots videos. of tons of Yeah, the of poop videos. video is there, right? Yep, you can now, find that. If you got youngins, the poop video really, really sticks well. Um, P-O-O-O-P. And it really does talk about this and your phone and what you might add to And how something. it spreads. Right. Yeah. It's a yes. good one. It's impactful. Um, so definitely look for it. Um, one of the things we wanted to talk about in this segment was preparing food for people um, who have an 
at-risk immune system. Um, so maybe they're elderly, maybe they're ill, or maybe they're really young. Um, and how do you prepare food for them? Uh, we both have experience with cooking for people that are elderly um, or are at risk. Um, yeah, I've had it both ways. When my son was very small, yeah. I made baby food for him, but a lot of people want to do that and they might be using their leftovers, which is fine because they've been cooked. If they use it, put it in the food processor right away while it's still hot, yeah. you're good and you cool it properly. But what a lot of people will do is just take an apple and put it in the food processor and make and apple, I got sauce, apple sauce. Yeah. But without washing it or properly peeling it. So did you add germs or pesticides to your kids' food? Right. Well, and it's just like ground beef, right? I mean, we're all used to cooking ground beef to 155 degrees because it's all been ground in. But don't give your there. little one ground beef. Well, of course not. But if you're doing, but <laughs> if you're doing like carrots or apples or whatever, whatever is on that outside surface, once it's pulverized and smoothied up, it becomes homogenous throughout the entire product, whatever bacteria is in there. Um, so what we recommend would be that if you're preparing food for a baby and you're making your own baby food and you're going to do carrots or green beans, why don't you blanch those first and really cook them and get them hot and then put them into a clean sanitized container after you've pureed them so that it's you know that all of the bacteria has been killed. It's a kill step. Um, but a lot of times people add stuff to it so they'll say oh yeah I need to thin this out a little bit and so they'll add things like apple cider. Is mm. it pasteurized? Right? Yeah. So you need to be really careful with those kinds of things also. Very Ru helpful. Making rice for babies is a real common thing. Yeah. But rice can really be a serious problem. So if it's fresh and it's not reheated and you're going to put it in there while it's still hot um, and then cooling it properly yeah. is a big deal because bacillus cirrus really grows in rice and you don't want to give that to your infant no. especially. So that's a, a big consideration when you're doing it. Do your research yeah. is really a big deal, right? Well, and think about how fast you're cooling things. If you have a big vat of rice, green pea, mash weirdness for your baby, how long is it going to take it to get cold? You need to get it to 41 degrees within four hours. And I do know a lot of people, and I did this too, when I was making baby food, I would freeze it in ice cube trays. Oh, that's So clever. I had it. I mean, you can can it up, but nobody's going to do that. No, but who's got the time? You can also put it in the refrigerator, but again, did you cool it properly, and how long was it in the refrigerator? Yeah. Because especially for an infant or a child under two, you really want to be careful with that. Yeah. But the same goes true if you're cooking for elderly. Yeah. Um, I cooked for my dad, who was 93, a lot of soups and all of that, and so cooling it was a big deal. Absolutely. Right? And yeah. then also, especially if you've got elderly in your home, or you're going to visit your grandparents, always take a look at what's in their refrigerator. Yeah, just see what's going on in there. Yeah. Yeah. My grandma, she went through chemotherapy and she loved fresh peaches and figuring out how to make sure that those fresh peaches were safe for her to ingest. That was something my mom and I had to consider. Yeah. And we ended up blanching them. We scalded them, uh, peeled them and scored them out and like she could eat them that right. way. Um, she could eat cooked peaches too, but making sure that the, the outside front, surface there is was nothing like fresh peaches. There's nothing like it. Yeah, there's nothing like no. it. No, and there's no way she was going to go through the season without those. So right. we had to figure out how to make it work. But again, a lot of things people don't think about: lemons and limes, yeah. avocados. Did you wash them before you're touching them? Because a lot of you times, slice through it. Right. Because yeah. a lot of times, lemons are something I like. For me personally, it goes in my iced tea. So yeah. did you yeah. wash it first or are you putting that contaminant all the way through? Yeah, you just yeah. inspired me the other day. I was making sun tea now that we're in the spring mode. I was making me some sun tea. Love that stuff. It really is fun. Yeah. But again, did you refrigerate it and how mm -hmm. long was it in there? Because people think it's just tea. Well, honestly, it isn't just tea. No. So don't leave it sit on the counter for a couple of days. Yeah, you can't do that. 
It would change the taste too, I'm sure, after a yes. while and grow some weird yeah. film. Yeah, yeah. But if, it, if, it, <laughs> <laughs> if it's got weird film on it, you should it's probably toss it. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But there are a lot of things that we do at home that we don't always think about what we're actually doing and what we might be adding to the Absolutely. food can be a real thing. We love to use leftovers, but were they cooled properly? Did you reheat them? Because your leftovers, you really do want to reheat them to at least 165. Every time. That's kind. It's a kill step. It doesn't kill yeah. everything, but it's a good kill step, and it's a good number to remember it is. for home. Yeah, right. that's like your max number. That's yeah. the, what we cook all poultry to as well. Um, and when you reheat food, you just don't know what has ended up in it from that right. point. So making sure that you're going for that highest temp is important. Right. There's some things that if you make it to 165, it's not going to be quite the same. But you have to use your better judgment with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing we were talking about too was three compartment sinks uh, when we had the Girl Scouts at Shed 5. And, um, it's something that, it, it was a mindset that they didn't understand because you don't have a three compartment sink at home. Right. Um, in your house and in my house, there's a two compartment sink with a dishwasher. So you can do your detergent, you can do your rinse, and then your dishwasher substitutes as a sanitizer. Some people may have three compartments, but many would not. So there's, there's a new study, I think it's like Vox or some big company like that, that talked about how many germs are on hand-washed dishes at home versus people that like used a full dishwasher cycle. And it is disgusting. It's one that you well, should look and up. and it's also, I remember um, when we were kids, no dishwasher, of course, it was a thousand years and ago. you have to go beat the plate on a rock. But it was who's washing <laughs> it and who's drying it. And yeah. the person drying it would be using a towel, which was that clean. So mm -hmm. it is one of those things, especially when you're dealing with high risk people like your little ones and your dish cloths and dish towels yeah. need to go in the washing machine on a regular basis. Well, and you should be air drying your items, not wiping them through. Right. Using that, that drainer mm -hmm. to air dry and making mm -hmm. sure that water was hot enough because that's one of the big things is yeah. hot water really does kill the germs. So. Yeah. And don't add too much bleach, right? Because then if you add too much um, bleach or whatever, it's... Yeah, most people aren't bleaching anything. But most yeah. of them aren't. But in our commercial setting, that is our approved sanitizer. It's a Wash diluted bleach. Sanitize. Yep. Bleach, yep. But I do yep. that in my washing machine. I you use, do, yeah. I use bleach or vinegar in my washing machine for my yep. towels. Yep. That yep. additional sanitizer. Yeah, I, I love yep. to bleach some towels. It's yep. a thing. I don't really. need any extra germs. <laughs> Well, I think we covered what we needed to for um, at-risk yes. food right. preparation. Um, right. Is there anything you'd like to add? Well, one of the other things that is makes me insane, okay. I love to teach my small kids how to set a table. Oh, yeah. But I really want them to wash their hands first, and yeah. please don't touch the part I put in my mouth yeah. right, when they're setting a table. So it really is a simple thing. But yeah. most people aren't really thinking about that when you've got your five-year-old setting the table. It's a good way to introduce it to them. If it's not quite time for them to be in the kitchen, you're getting ready for Thanksgiving, set the table. But this is how you do it. Right. This is the expectation. Yeah. yeah. Lead by expectation always. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining. It's always fun having you on the show. Um, and we will see you next time when My Kitchen with Jake continues.